Time to talk to the Liberal Senator James Patterson, Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security. To take us there, here was the ASIO Director General <clears throat> on the politicisation of his agency's work. ASIO um, is apolitical. My staff are apolitical. They put their lives on the line to actually protect Australians and Australia from threats to security. The Act, the ASI Act, requires us to be apolitical. I take that very seriously. We well, can't make your job any easier when our politicians do politicise it. So I'll, I'll leave the politics to the politicians, but I'm very clear with everyone that I need to be that um, that's not helpful for us. Senator Patterson, welcome to the program. Thank you, David. I'm only sorry I don't have any more online dating tips for your viewers this week. <laughs> it was very good last week. Look, as chair of the Joint Standing <laughs> Committee on Intelligence and Security, a principal question first. Do you believe it is appropriate or not to use classified information for political gain? I listened very carefully to the words that Mike Burgess uttered on 7.30 last week, and this week, sorry, and I, I take his, his warning very seriously. I think there have been a range of references to classified material both in the parliament uh, and in the media from a range of sources, and we should be very mindful of the warning that he makes, and I understand why he has that anxiety as an ASIO Director General. If you look at the history of ASIO, it was in the past a political football. It did become politicised. A long time ago. Yeah, well, famously after the 1954 mm. election, Doc Evatt, the opposition leader accused ASIO of manufacturing the Petrov defection to aid the re-election of the Menzies government. We've had two royal commissions into ASIO well, Look, as look at what's happening now though. It was the Defence Minister Peter Dutton who publicly referred to classified intelligence that he'd seen while making the case that China wants Labor to win the election. Was that politicising intelligence? Well, he wasn't the only person uh, to make a no, reference. But was he? He wasn't. Well, I think it's important we point out here, David, that there were references from both sides of politics to classified information mm. in the parliament. And we get to the and other one, fact, but was, was this one? Well, and in fact, in the media reports that speculated about the uh, ultimate target of that interference operation, cited Labor Party sources. So I think the point that the ASIO Director General is making is that all political parties, all political actors need mm. to be very careful about that, and I heed that, heed that warning. I, I think you're talking about Labor's Kimberly Kitching and, and what she said in in Senate estimates. Is that the other side of this you're talking about? Yeah, and look, I'm not being critical of either Kimberly Kitching or Peter Dutton. Uh, they are individual members of Parliament who are exercising their own judgment, mm. and there's a very good reason why the Parliament has privilege and we can speak freely in the Parliament. One, one's a Labor backbencher, though, one's a Defence Minister. Again, was it appropriate for Peter Dutton to talk about classified information as part of that political attack? Well, I think it's important to remember, David, that Peter Dutton didn't refer to any classified information. He didn't divulge any classified information. No. He just he just indicated there was classified information. And is that appropriate? Well, I think we should be very careful. I think we should all listen listen to the Director so it's, General it's, of ASIO. It's not appropriate. Well, David, I, I'm very careful about what I do with the information I have access to. But was Peter Dutton being appropriate? I think we should all heed the warning of the ASIO Director General, all of us, that we should be careful in referring to classified information. All right, we'll take that as a no, it was not appropriate. OK. Uh, the former ASIO boss and former head of foreign affairs, head of defence, Dennis Richardson, certainly feels uh, the government has been manufacturing differences uh, when it comes to China. He says this will only help China. Um, you have raised some concern about Dennis Richardson's own record on uh, Huawei. What are you trying to suggest there? David, what I was trying to suggest is that it's OK in a Liberal democracy for an elected politician like me or the Prime Minister or anyone else to have a disagreement with a former public servant, even an eminent one like Dennis Richardson. Uh, Dennis and I spoke on Friday. Uh, he told me that in 2011, when he took leave from DFAT as Secretary, it wasn't to negotiate with Huawei the sponsorship agreement, it was just to make an initial pitch to Huawei on behalf of the Canberra Raiders for so that did... lucrative sponsorship agreement. You got that bit wrong? Well, I think it's a subtle difference between negotiation shade and pitch, but anyway, I'll leave that for others to decide. He also acknowledged to me that he did, in March uh, 2019 at the AFR Business Summit, publicly float the idea that Huawei could be allowed into Australia's 5G network and the same model that the United Kingdom was then pursuing with some mm. safeguards and assurances. But he told me that he, since the government didn't make that decision, he accepted the government's decision. He now supports our 5G policy. And I welcome that because I never thought that it was in Australia's interest to follow the UK model. The advice from our agencies was very clear that the risk could not be mitigated satisfactorily. And indeed, the UK has now followed the Australian model and has taken indeed. Huawei all out of their 5G network. I think that was a very sensible decision. But he says your, your attack on him the other day was, was grubby and factually incorrect. Now, I take it, you, as you've just said, you've spoken since then. Do you offer any apology? 
Well, I didn't use any emotive language in my contribution. I just pointed to information that was already on the public and record. Your facts I, didn't, were wrong. I didn't refer to anyone as grubby or despicable. Uh, but Dennis and I have agreed that we should catch up for a beer and I look forward to that. OK, but no apology? No. And you don't accept you got any facts wrong? Well, I said that he negotiated. I should have said that he pitched. But otherwise, I think it was uh, very accurate references for information on the public record. OK. Uh, yeah, you said that he publicly advocated Huawei should be involved in the 5G rollout. That was referring to his comments at the uh, March 2018 AFR Business Summit where he said we should follow the UK model of allowing Huawei into 5G with safeguards and I didn't think the with safeguards, safeguards were sufficient. Mm, OK. Uh, so no apology? No. All right, let's talk about Richard Miles then. Um, the Prime Minister called him a Manchurian candidate. You disagree? Oh, his course is not a Manchurian candidate and the Prime Minister very quickly withdrew that comment. I note when Anthony Albanese made the same comment a day later towards the Prime Minister, he didn't withdraw it. So I think the Labor Party's outrage over this is confected. I mean, I think what we know is happening here, David, is that the Labor Party has the most left-wing leader since Gough Whitlam. They're very sensitive about their weakness on China and they're very uncomfortable with that now being pointed out. We'll and come to that, but um, do you have any concerns about Richard Miles? No, I don't have any concerns about his loyalty to Australia. I think he gave a very bad speech in Beijing in what September 2019. That? What was wrong with the speech? Well, he proposed that there should be closer military cooperation between Australia uh, and the People's Liberation Army. That's the same People's Liberation Army that's out there aiming lasers at our uh, Royal Australian Air Force pilots right now. Well, he said in that speech that Australia and China should explore, quote, political cooperation and even defence cooperation. What's wrong about that? I think uh, we shouldn't be cooperating with what has become a very serious strategic adversary that is trying to coerce and intimidate Australia. Because a month after he gave that speech, the Defence Department issued this press release announcing the next round mm. of military exercises with China, Operation Pandaroo. These are military exercises your government, the coalition government, began. How come it's bad for Labor to suggest it, but OK for your side to do it? They were long-standing pre-existing arrangements and what Richard they, they, Miles no, they, was suggesting... They began under the, under the coalition yes, government, but they, but they are long-standing, long before Richard Miles' speech. And what he was suggesting is we should take it up an extra tempo. We should increase it even further well, on think, a political and military level. I'm not sure if you're verbaling uh, him there, Senator. I've got the quotes. He said, our starting point has to be that we respect China, deeply value our relationship with China. We must seek to build it. And not just in economic terms, but also through exploring political cooperation and even defence cooperation. He's yeah. not saying up the tempo on military well, I think exercises. it's very clear he was. Why, why else would he How make reference clear? to it? it? If, if all he was saying, David, is we should just continue what we've already been doing, then why did he say it at all? And why has it never been posted on his website? Today, the only place you can read Richard Miles' speech is on my website, not on his. Don't you think that that's a bit strange? Should the Don't Prime you think Minister, that he's obviously the... embarrassed about something in that speech and doesn't want to talk about it? Should the Prime Minister post everything else speeches he gives on his website? I, I don't know. I don't run the Prime Minister's website. It's up to him to post what he wants to post. But I think it's strange that Richard Miles hasn't uh, posted it still today. Should he, the PM, perhaps post his speech he gave to the Christian Churches Congress uh, on his that's, website? That's a matter for the PM, okay. uh, David. What about Anthony Albanese? Mm. Uh, what evidence is there that he is weak on China? There's lots of examples, David, and, and it goes not just to him as, as leader, but the entire Labor Party. You know, Labor often says, oh, we vote for national security legislation in the parliament, so that's sufficient. And look, I hesitate to use this example because Senator Keneally is one of the members of the PJCS that I work very well with. But in 2017, when the Turnbull government introduced espionage and foreign interference legislation, the Chinese government accused Australia of racism. And in the Benelong by-election that year, Senator Keneally said that she'd heard voters say that Australia was China-phobic and that we were scaremongering. So she was elevating those false claims against Australia. Now, Labor ultimately voted for that legislation, but it's a good example of how they seek partisan advantage on so-called bipartisan issues. OK, that, that's five years ago. Uh, there's, there's plenty of track record on both sides when it comes to changing positions on China. What evidence is there now okay. that that Anthony Albanese is weak on China? I'll, I'll cite some more recent examples then, David. Uh, in December 2020, after the list of 14 demands had been released by the Chinese embassy, in which they said uh, we would have to compromise on core issues of sovereignty like freedom of the press and freedom of the parliament, uh, Anthony Albanese said it was the Morrison government's fault that we couldn't get uh, a Chinese counterpart to pick up the phone and it reflect poorly on us. Now, he knew when he said that, that the only way we could get them on the phone is if we sacrificed on a core issue of sovereignty. And so it's up to him to say which of those 14 demands would he give in to? Would he silence the press? Would he silence the parliament? Would he silence independent think tanks? 
Davis. Would he abolish our reviews of foreign investment? Would it's, a he get rid of the, the, it's a bit of a leap, though, to say that he was suggesting we should give in to China's demands. He never said that. OK, I'll give you another example, David. Uh, a couple of years ago at the Labor Party conference, Paul Keating said that the heads of our intelligence agencies were nutters and that they should be sacked if Labor came for office. After Paul Keating made that disgraceful attack on our intelligence chiefs, our serving current intelligence chiefs, Anthony Albanese said that Paul Keating is always worth listening to and he has wise counsel. And, now, he, dis and think... he disagrees with him on these issues of China. He said that repeatedly. Well, I don't think uh, that's wise counsel, David, and I don't think we should be building up someone who's got clearly insane views on the China relationship. Okay, but you're taking some selective quotes here. I'm still searching for the evidence that Anthony Albanese is weak on China now. OK, I'll give you another example, David. Uh, Labor Party says that they support AUKUS. That's very welcome. I'm glad that they do that. But at the same time, they've spent much more energy and much more effort being aggrieved on behalf of the French government uh, for being upset about a council contract than they have in demonstrating interest towards the defence capability we're going to acquire, which we need to defend our country. Anthony Albanese has said that we were gaslighting in relation to that agreement. Penny Wong has said accused of us of vandalism. And, of course, we know Labor's record when they're in government. They cut defence spending to 1.56% of GDP. That was the lowest level since 1938. They ripped money out of the AFP. Mm. They subjected ASIO and our own other intelligence agencies to an efficiency dividend of 4%. And it got so bad that the former head of the PJCIS, Anthony mm. Byrne, had to stand up in Parliament and denounce his own government for it. That is their record. Well, ag again, we're talking about events of, of 10 years ago. And look, fair enough, they did, uh, you know, defence spending as a percentage of GDP did fall. And we can go through the government's record of spending on submarines that it's no longer buying from the French or the Taipan helicopters that it's had to scrap and so on. Mm. What now, though, tells us that Labor would do anything differently on national security? David, I think we need to take the whole record into account. We can't just cut it off and say we won't look at anything before then. I mean, Anthony Albanese tried to table in the Parliament the other day an essay he wrote in, as a university student in 1981. So if he thinks that's relevant, and I understand he shopped it around to the press gallery as well, if that's relevant, then I think what they did in the government the last time they were office is relevant. I mean, Anthony Albanese sat around the Cabinet table that signed off on those cuts to our intelligence agencies, mm. that signed off on those cuts to our defence force. Okay. Their own white yeah. paper in 2009, David, said we urge needed 12 conventional submarines. What steps did they take in government to order those in six years? None at all. They didn't order a single naval vessel okay. at all and we're still making up today for those consequences. But if it's fair to look at records, uh, you know, this government uh, looked seriously at an extradition treaty with China, mm. allowed the port of Darwin to be leased. I mean, there's, there's a long I'm list. I'm glad of... you mentioned those, David, because I was the first government backbencher to tell the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, that I would cross the floor, if need be, okay. on the extradition treaty the on point, China. The point is both and, sides, and, both no, sides no, this have, is important, have a this history important, David. And the Labor Party only announced their opposition to the extradition treaty after I and others said we we're going to cross the floor. They waited until they knew so they that there was government backbenchers who were unhappy with it. Okay. Well, I'm not taking credit for <laughs> it, but what I'm saying is they made a political calculation up until that point, they were going to support right. the extradition treaty. Finally, uh, 12 months ago, soon after you took this role as chair of the committee, you talked up the strength of bipartisanship mm. when it comes to national security. You told The Guardian, quote, it's very powerful for us to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder across the political spectrum and send a very strong message to the world that we won't be separated on these issues of national interest. What's changed? Is it the approaching election? David, I don't just talk about bipartisanship, I've delivered it. On my watch in the last 12 months on the PJCS, we've handed down 17 bipartisan reports on issues as diverse as critical infrastructure, high-risk terrorist offenders and the dark web. And many of those uh, reports have required hours of painstaking negotiations with my Labor counterparts. I take that responsibility very seriously. But it doesn't mean I'm going to lie about their record. I think we have to be honest. Albanese is trying to paint a small target. He's trying to sneak into government. And in a liberal democracy, we are absolutely entitled to examine their record and make competing complaints ab claims about what we think they'll do in office. It's up to them to meet the high bar that we're setting for bipartisanship. If they're not comfortable meeting that standard, well, then they can justify that to the Australian people. Senator Patterson, thanks for joining us. Thanks, David.